301. 301 marks the years of racial segregation, oppression, and degradation in South Africa. The arrival of colonizers in Africa, which culminated with the Berlin Conference in 1884, has been a defining moment in influencing how Africans see themselves and the world. It has been 23 years since the end of apartheid, but systematic racism has not followed suit. In a country where the face of unemployment and poverty is still black, where representation and diversity in the corporate world and economy is still lacking, and education is still seen as a privilege only offered to those who can afford it, it would not be unprecedented to make this claim. 23 years is a pretty short amount of time in the capsule of time. And looking around in this room, I could easily assume that if you have not lived through apartheid, it is most likely that there is someone around you, even next to you, or even in your homes that has. The atrocities, trauma, and displacement faced by generations of people of color echo into our modern society. The ripple effects of having land, culture, and people taken away is evident in the mindset of people of color today. The damage, for instance, placed on black men and black fathers through emasculation and being, sub, being put apart to white men has created an inferiority complex that has given this inability to fulfill their roles in society. Absenteeism, alcoholism, and the inability to father are consequences of systematic racism that have been passed down through generations. Psychoanalyst and black thinker, Franz Fanon, once said, for the black man, there is only one destiny, and it is white. Colonialism and apartheid were systems not only created to hinder the oppressed and marginalized physically, but most importantly, psychologically. Black consciousness activist Steve Biko once said, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. And when speaking about trauma and the atrocities that were experienced during apartheid and colonialism, there is a sense of shame and denial. And when my father was a student during apartheid, he was arrested. And to this day, we don't speak about his time in prison. And this tendency to conceal the severity of what our parents went through, grandparents went through during colonialism, creates a rift and hindrance between us, the born freeze of this generation, and the older generation, and then influences the discussions we have about mental health. Being strong, having a thick skin, and soldiering on are values instilled in most upbringings of, of children of color. And during the struggle against apartheid, our parents sacrificed many things, such as their education, their lives, and to an extent, their sanity. That is why when topics of anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and depression arise, it is met with the stigma of being weak and ungrateful. Facing microaggressions on a daily basis and having to navigate spheres and, and spaces that were formerly white only creates a unique, different type of trauma one that our parents do not seem to understand. And for children who are thrown into in these environments that were formerly white, there is this pressure to overachieve and overcompensate. I thought when I was younger that if I made as many white friends as possible, I could be seen as valid, as equal, as worthy. But the clear divide that race and class make is evident from a young age already. And I, you realize you're different when little Amber says, my mommy told me that you're so brown, it's because you tan so much in the summer. And Mrs. Bowie asks if you don't have an English name because cucumber, 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 and cucumber, cucumber. 
is way too difficult to say and just reverts to calling you by your surname. The violence that we encounter is different to the one that has occurred in the past, which was legislative and enforced by the government. But it is one that is subtle and persistent, and even dangerous because it is so difficult to rectify. And from a young age already, these feelings of extreme self-awareness and shame creep up. And for example, a six-year-old child, expressing psychological stress is often difficult to pa for parents. And this inability, this block of communication about psychological stress with parents of color, it trickles down to adolescence and adulthood. It is easy to get lost when the guidance we expect to receive is not there. Where do we go when our loved ones, parents, and guardians cannot guide us in the correct direction? And even if we do seek help independently, we are met with misdiagnosis, white fragility, and gaslighting. What do we do if white mental health practitioners cannot treat us? The mere study and science of psychology itself has a basis and foundation laid by, by majority being white men, such as Freud, Watson, and Wundt. And can we honestly say, looking at statistics today, that mental health practitioners represent the demographics of South Africa? This inability to comprehend what born frees of color face today in South Africa forces many young people of color to seek new avenues of expression and acceptance. Regardless of class, young people seek validation in similar ways. And for youths who come from townships, which are places created by the apartheid government, not only to disadvantage people of color, um, to disadvantage people of color geographically, but because of the economic um, standing to make sure that people of color don't thrive, Gangsterism, crime, and violence are areas where, people, where young people find this support structure. But when the discussions and, discuss, discussions and debates about gangsterism and violence and crime creep up, we never asked why, after 23 years of supposedly living in a free South Africa, young people are still joining gangs. Why is it that young people are still so angry and still so violent? and why people are still having to resort to desperate measures in order to put food on their tables. And for you to come from privileged, middle-class backgrounds, like I do, the pressure of assimilation and alienation can create anger and resentment. Being this feeling of, have, of being a fish out of water, being the only one who looks like you, speaks like you, and comes from a family, like you do, symptoms of anxiety and depression can creep up. I am a black girl, and I am angry, and I am broken. And sometimes when I wish I could scream, all I can do is bite my lip. And when I see children of color, men of color, women of color, dying, being killed, I cry. Because I can't help but wonder if that could ever be my son, my daughter, neighbor, classmate. The South African economy has lost 232 billion rand because of loss of productivity due to depression in the workplace. Why is it that the South African government is not prioritizing mental health, and most importantly, reform in mental health? Compared to other constitutions in the world, South Africa is one of the, the most progressive and forward-thinking constitutions. But still, the people of South Africa, people of color of South Africa, young people of color of South Africa are still suffering in silence. I stand here on the stage today to speak about the importance of a happy and psychologically healthy society. 
It all starts with dialogue, being comfortable with being uncomfortable, speaking about our feelings, our emotions, and understanding the consequences of coming from a complicated history. It all starts with speaking out, speaking out of spaces that we're not used to, not only in our comfortable spaces where we can express ourselves to the fullest. And in order to create a thriving and beautiful future in a South Africa that we all would love to live in, we need to make sure and put importance and prioritize mental health, especially for people of color, and break down those barriers, those stigmas, those taboos surrounded surrounded and created um, around mental health. And that starts with each and every one of you speaking to each other, trying to understand each other. That's how we move forward. Thank you.